Welcome to AFSPA Talks, a production of the American Foreign Service Protective Association with Chief Operating Officer Kyle Longton. Be sure to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast channel. Enjoy the episode. Hi, and welcome to another episode of AFSPA Talks. I'm Kyle Longton, and I'm coming to you on my own today to kick off our mini-series on Medicare. Today, AFSPA Talks Medicare and the FEHB. This will be a longer than usual episode taken from a webinar led by AFSPA CEO Paula Jacob on January 19th. It's longer than usual because this is a complicated topic, but there is a ton of information in this episode, including Medicare basics, information on Part B premiums, discussion of the different types of providers uh, and under Medicare, how Medicare and the FEHB work together, and how your FEHB coverage works if you choose not to enroll in Medicare Part B. Um, this might not be an episode for everybody today, but I think all of us are going to need to consider it sometime in the future. There is a link in the show notes to the video recording of the, this webinar so that you can follow along with the slides. Um, I highly recommend that. We're also including some of the questions from the audience that were part of the webinar, so be sure to stick it to the end of the episode for that. We have two more episodes coming up in this mini series. Next week, I hope you'll join us when Med- AFSPA talks Medicare, TRICARE, and the FEHB with Dr. Christine Hunter. And that'll be an overview of how those three programs work together. On February 21st, AFSPA talks Medicare Advantage plans to give you, and frankly, me, all of us, a better understanding of these plans that are growing in popularity. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform so that you don't miss an episode. So for now, let's get started with AFSPA Talks Medicare and the FHB with AFSPA CEO Paula Jacob. Thank you very much, Kyle, and welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to be here to talk about Medicare and the FEHB and how they work together. So we've got a lot of material to cover, and I'd like to just get started here. So first up, there are many regulations around the FEHB, as you know, and there is also a lot of regulations around Medicare, both the original Medicare and the Medicare Advantage plans. So I encourage you to whatever health plan you have, whether it's the Foreign Service Benefit Plan or another one of the excellent federal health plans, you review section nine of your FEHB brochure and because they will have particulars on how they handle the relationship between Medicare and that specific plan. And also review the material that you will receive from Medicare, from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and also from a whole slew of different organizations who want to sell you things like a Medigap policy or a Medicare Advantage plan. But really review that information so you know exactly what the rules and the regulations are. The information that we're going to share is for federal employees and annuities and annuitants only. It is not applicable to anybody who does not have the FEHB program. So it's not applicable to your friends, your family, your neighbors, what, whatever. Um, And it certainly isn't applicable to any of the private sector insurance, that other commercial insurance. It's just for you. So while there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that I'm going to hopefully shed some light on, the biggest question that we all that we are all facing is, should you enroll in Medicare Part B? Or as I like to say, to be or not to be. And hopefully by the end of the session, you will have, like Kyle said, more answers and questions, but also some, some little pearls of wisdom that you really need to think about when you are looking at your individual decision regarding Medicare Part B. Some of the acronyms that I'm going to use through this presentation are, if when you see FEHB, that means the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program not necessarily one specific plan like the Foreign Service Plan, Blue Cross Blue Shield, APWU, any of those. It is the umbrella organization. Where you see FFS, those are the normal fee-for-service plans, the traditional type of health plans. HMO are the health maintenance organizations. These are limited to, usually limited to a geographic area with very specific providers in mind. When you see OOP, that means out of pocket, that means out of your pocket, not our pocket. And when you see OPM, 
we're talking about the Office of Personnel Management. They are, they oversee, they are the agency that oversees the entire Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. So hopefully that will give you a clearer picture when I am running through these slides and there's a lot of stuff to go through. So first up, Medicare and overseas. Just so you know, Medicare does not cover care you receive outside of the United States, except in very limited circumstances, cruise ships, th th things like that. So generally, your fee-for-service FEHB plan is primary for your services you receive outside uh, the 50 United States. They are the ones who will pay for that. So regardless of whether you have Medicare A and or B, if you receive care outside of the U.S., you must file a claim with your health plan. Let's talk about what we're gonna what we're gonna view today. So Medicare has four parts, med, and we're gonna go through Medicare's parts A, B, C, and D. We're gonna go through how much they cost, the premium costs, the out-of-pocket costs, your that your pocket, and the different providers types. Number two. We're gonna put it all together and talk about Medicare coverage and the FEHB program. And then last but certainly not least, I'm going to talk about what happens if you decide not to take Medicare Part B, and then how does your FEHB plan work in that? So what are the parts of Medicare? Medicare has four parts. Medicare Part A is one of the original Medicare plans. This is where you find the hospital insurance and it's free in most cases. You've already paid in taxes. Medicare Part B, that's another part of original Medicare. And this is where you find your medical insurance. Now there is a monthly premium attached to it. This year, that monthly premium is $170.10 for 2022, and that is standard before the Medicare means testing applies. The more you make, the, the, the higher your income, the higher that monthly premium is going to be. And I'll get, I'll get into more detail in a second on that. Medicare Part C is that's the Medicare Advantage program. So these are the more comprehensive programs. It will include your Medicare Part B premiums. You'll have to pay for that. But depending on the type of Medicare Advantage plan you have, there may be additional premium attached to that. So if you are looking at that, you really need to, to understand all of the premium that you have to pay for that. Medicare Part D is, your, is the newest member of the Medicare family. This is the prescription drug coverage. And there is a monthly premium attached to that. There are hundreds of different prescription drug coverage plans under the Medicare Part D program, and the cost varies by the, the plan that you have, and it is means tested as well. So let's start off with Medicare Part A. These are the covered services under Medicare Part A. Inpatient hospital care, not observation care, not when you're looking at going into a hospital on an emergency basis, and they may hook you up to an IV, they have you in the emergency room, they may even have you in the hall, or even in a, in a hospital room, and you think you're under inpatient coverage. You're not, you're, what they're, you're under what they call observation care. That's not covered by Medicare Part A. Medicare Part A though does cover hospice care services and some very, very limited inpatient care in a skilled nursing home not custodial care, not intermediate care, not long-term care, but just that initial skilled nursing facility care. That is covered under Medicare Part A. Everyone eligible for Medicare Part A pre, um, premium free should enroll regardless of whether they're working or not working. You should enroll at age 65 whether you are working or retired, doesn't make any sense not to enroll. Now, if you decide not to enroll in Medicare Part B um, because you are either working or you don't feel that you wanted to, to, to take it, you're happy with the plans you, you have, and you start receiving Social Security benefits, whether it's at 67, age 70, whatever it is, Social Security is going to automatically 
sign you up and enroll you in both Medicare Part A, which you should already have, but also Medicare Part B. And I want to point this out because you may not want Medicare Part B, even at age 67 or 70, when you, when you start receiving your Social Security benefits. If you are in that category and you do not want Medicare Part B, you're going to have to notify Medicare and ask them to take you off of their Part B roles and then send you a up-to-date card that says Medicare Part A only. Just something to keep in the back of your, head, your, your, your mind for now. So let's talk about Medicare Part B services and what that covers. Medicare Part B covers your doctor services and tests. It covers outpatient hospital services, and that includes observation care. That is covered under Medicare Part B. It also has very, very limited home health care services, but you must be completely homebound in order to receive those services. This is where you'll find durable medical equipment like hospital beds, wheelchairs, things like, like that. And also kidney dialysis is covered under Medicare Part B. Some other services that are covered under Medicare Part B, certain preventive and screening services and a yearly wellness visit, not to be confused or put in the same category as a routine physical examination. Here's how Medicare Part B ha handles your physical exam. When you first enroll in Medicare Part B, they will offer you what they call a welcome to Medicare physical exam. For the years after that, they offer what they call a yearly wellness visit. You go to the doctor, you fill out a questionnaire, kind of like a health risk assessment, and your doctor may go over your, your answers. It doesn't cover your, what you think to be a normal physical exam. The, the, um, the, the EKG, the lab test, all of that. But not to fear, if you have the FEHB, that your FEHB plan will continue to cover the routine physical exam. It's great to be a Fed, and it's great to keep, be able to keep your FEHB coverage into retirement with you. So you still have access to your routine physical examinations. So a couple of things to know, some quick facts about Medicare Part B. Enrollment in Medicare for auspices under the FEHB program is voluntary at age 65. The FEHB program does not require you to enroll in Medicare Part B. You must pay a monthly premium. And like I said before, that monthly premium for 2022 is $170.10. That's the standard premium. Now you may have to pay a penalty if you are not enrolled at your first opportunity, which is at age 65, by the way, and then you decide to enroll at a later date, like 67 or 70 or whatever. But under certain circumstances, you can defer that Medicare Part B decision beyond age 65. And a very important one is if you are employed and are covered under a group health plan that is based on your current employment. Now, why is this important to you? Because many people, several people here may decide to work beyond age 65, especially if I have civil servants here, and they may not want to take Medicare Part B, and that's all right, because you don't have to. As long as you are working, employed, and you are covered under your employer's active group health plan, based on your current employment. You can actually defer that Medicare Part B decision. Now, Medicare Part B, and the reason that this is so important is because Medicare Part B premium is means tested. And that means that it is based on your modified adjusted gross income that is shown on your tax statement, your 1040 tax form. What could that mean for you? that can mean a lot for you. So here's how this works. Every single year, they look back and they look back to two years be before and they look at your, your modified adjusted gross income line on your 1040 statement. And that is what they will base your Medicare Part B premium on for this year. So say that you 
enroll, you want to enroll in Medicare Part B this year in 2022, they will look back to your 2020 tax statement and say you are married filing jointly and your modified adjusted gross income was $230,000 on a, a joint tax return. That means that your Medicare Part B premium for this year is going to be $340.20, a lot of money. So you really need to make sure that you understand what it is that you're facing vis-a-vis -vis the Medicare Part B premium and that, and that for the higher income people, because it will be based on your modified adjusted gross income as stated on your tax statement. Now, of course, you can request what they call a premium redetermination. As you know, there's, there's a lot of qualifying life events. You're familiar with them under the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, right? There's also qualifying life events under the Medicare program. And one of those qualifying life events that might trigger a redetermination is if you or your spouse stopped working or reduced hours. So at that point, you can ask them to look at not two years back, but at your most recent tax information. You can do that by calling the Medicare number, the social security number on the screen, and also review the rules for higher income beneficiaries that I have here on the, the website on this slide. So keep that in mind when you first enroll in Medicare Part B and you might be facing that modified adjusted gross income premium because it, 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 makes, it can make a world of difference in your out-of-pocket expense. So moving on to Medicare Part C, this is the Medicare Advantage plans, and here's some quick facts about that. These are the comprehensive types of options that have been approved by Medicare. It's a way that you can receive your Medicare benefits, but from a private company. You can receive additional benefits as well, because remember it is more like an HMO. So you may receive additional dental or podiatry or something like that. And it, in many cases, it could have lower cost sharing. Now you, it, you do receive your Medicare Part A benefits and your Medicare Part B benefits, that coverage, but it's not from the original Medicare. So the rules are different and there are different out-of-pocket costs also that ap apply, but it is an option for you even as a federal annuitant. This is one of the very few times that you can actually suspend your FEHB coverage is if you enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan. You can actually suspend that coverage so you're not paying that FEHB premium, but it's kind of there just in the back of, of wait, waiting in case you want to come back to it. The good thing about this is that you can actually return to the FEHB program because, and it doesn't terminate your FEHB coverage. Remember, if you cancel your FEHB coverage as an annuitant, you might never ever get it back, but you're not canceling your coverage, you're suspending your coverage. So it is an option for you if you are interested in enrolling in one of the commercial Medicare Advantage plans, and there are tons of them out there for you. Now, the last one is the Medicare Part D plan, and these are the prescription drug coverage. And here's some quick facts about that. There's a premium attached to it. It varies by the plan. The higher level of the plan, the higher premium you're going to pay, and you're going to pay an additional premium if you're in that higher income level, because that modified adjusted gross income does apply for, for you for Medicare Part D as well. You are still going to have deductibles and co-pays and co-insurance. Now, it's good to be a, a Fed because I don't care what FEHB plan you have, whether it's foreign service or Blue Cars or any of, of the, the HMOs, your plan offers creditable coverage. What that means for this purpose is that it is your whatever prescription benefit coverage you have under your FEHB plan is at least as good, if not better, than the standard Medicare Part D plan. What does that mean for you? 
Well, according to OPM, federal retirees likely will not benefit from enrolling in a Medicare Part D plan and paying that extra prescription drug benefit premium because you already have excellent drug coverage through your existing FEHB plan. So it's really some, something to think about. Not a lot of people who have one of the FEHB plans will take a Medicare Part D plan on top of that because you already, already have great coverage. Okay, so how do you sign up for a Medicare? Well, here's how it goes. Your initial enrollment period is this for seven months and it is the, the three month period before your 65th birthday the month of your 50, your 65th birthday and the three month period after your 65th birthday. Everyone eligible for premium free Medicare Part A, again, I say should enroll at age 65. Medicare Part B, that you, you probably wanna think about that. If you do not enroll at your initial opportunity in Medicare Part B, there is always a general enrollment period. And this is annually from January to March. You can roll in it then, it will take effect in July of that year. But understand there is a, what they call a Medicare Part B late enrollment penalty and it's hefty. It will last you for as long as you have me Medicare. So it's not like one and done, it's like death do you part. And it is a, it's a 10% increase for each full 12 month period that you did not sign up. What does that mean? Well, if you didn't sign up at age 65 and you decide at a later date to, to, to sign up, maybe you decide to sign up at age 70. You have gone maybe five years or five 12 month periods without having Medicare Part B. So they will take the, that, the year that you sign up to premium, attach 50% more because of the penalty and that will last as long as you have Medicare Part B. That doesn't even touch upon any of the, the means adjustment for me, means testing. So they really mean, mean business about that late penalty. Now there's a special enrollment period and this may apply to a lot of you out there. This special enrollment period is the eight month period after your employment ends or your current employment group health plan ends. Now, retiree health plans does not count as current. It is only current employment group health plans. Here are some forms that you're going to need to have when you finally do enroll and you want to enroll in Medicare Part B under this special enrollment period. You need the CMS 40B enroll application and you need the CMS L564 form that is proof of current employment and it has to be signed by your employer. What that just says is that you have been a current employee and you have had your health insurance under current employment group health plan so that they know that you have followed all the rules. I always recommend that you start early on this, have HR completed shortly before your retirement date. No matter what you decide on this, whether you decide to take Medicare Part B, when you take me me Medicare Part A, when you decide to take Medicare Part B, you decide not to take Medicare Part B at age 65, whatever it is for you, notify your FEHB plan because we have to know how to pay the claim because there's some coordination of benefits that goes on and we have to know whether Medicare has to pay or whether we pay first and your claim could be delayed until we find that information out. Here are the ways to sign up for Medicare, okay? You can apply for Medicare Part A and or Medicare Part B by going to the website, ssa.gov. You can call, you can go visit a local security a social security office, but you probably need to make sure that they're open and they are accepting in-person visits, especially now with COVID. And if you are outside of the United States, you can enroll in your nearest social security office, which usually is inside the embassy or consulate. And I've also provided a website for you that will let you know all of, of the different options that you have. 
about when you can sign up for Medicare. So hopefully that's an, a helpful resource for you. Okay, now we've gone through all the different types of Medicare and all that. Let's talk about those all important out-of-pocket costs. So for this year, for 2022, your, for Medicare purposes, the Medicare Part A hospital deductible is $1,556 for your first 60 days in each benefit period. If you are hospital confined beyond that, then that it that then it starts the clock ticking and you will be charged a daily copay of $389. If you're really sick and in the hospital beyond that 90th day, then there is an additional that goes up to $778 a daily copay and that comes out of your lifetime reserve. Lucky for you, you're a Fed because most of the FEHB fee-for-service plans will pick up that because they coordinate benefits with Medicare. So that's great, you can breathe now. Skilled nursing facility benefits, not so much. So the first 20 days of skilled nursing facility, as long as you are in a Medicare approved skilled nursing facility and are receiving skilled care, Medicare will pick up the first 20 days. Now, after that, you are responsible for $194.50 a day from the 21st day on. Some of your FEHB plans do provide benefits for skilled nursing care, but it is limited. All of the FEHB plans are very, very li limited. So again, I would check with your FEHB plan to see how they coordinate with Medicare. We all, if we have the skilled nursing benefits, we will coordinate with Medicare from day one. So really look at that. Out-of-pocket costs for Medicare Part B, not quite as draconian. It is for your annual de deductible for this year is $233. You will be responsible for additional 20% coinsurance. And depending on what doctor you go to, you may be responsible for extra billing for non-participating physicians. That is depending on your FEHB plan. So now let's talk about those different types of physicians. Everybody thinks there are like three, or that there are hundreds of different types of physicians out there. They're not, there are, for Medicare purposes, there are just three. And let's talk about those. So if you're retired and over age 65, and you have a, the, the fee-for-service fee plans, your Medicare Part B is primary. If you go to a provider that accepts Medicare assignment, all right, that provider agrees to be paid by Medicare and to accept the amount that Medicare approves for their services. The provider can only charge you that Medicare Part B deductible and that 20% coinsurance amount. Lucky for you, you're fed. Your FEHB plans will pick up that cost sharing. So you are more or less golden if you go to a Medicare Part B primary pro pro provider that accepts Medicare assignment. The second type of provider is what we call a non-participating provider. That doesn't necessarily mean they don't participate in, in, in Medicare because they do, but they just do not accept Medicare assignment and they are actually allowed to charge a little more, but there is a limit to what they can charge. Thus the name, the limiting charge. So these types of physician can charge more than the Medicare approved amount, usually only about 15%. Your FEHB plans will cover that regular cost sharing, but they are not necessarily required to cover that extra non-participating limiting charge. Depending on your health plan, some of the health plans will pick it up. Some of them will not. The Foreign Service Benefit Plan, by the way, does pick up that extra cost share for you. I have a chart. So if you are going to a, Medic a Medicare doctor that accepts Medicare assignments, say the doctor bills you for $1,000, 
the Medicare approved amount just for this pur purposes are is eight eight hundred dollars. That's not going to happen. But just for for the math, Medicare is going to pay six hundred and forty dollars. Your FEHB plan is going to pick up that that balance of one sixty, and your liability is nothing. Say you go to one of those Medicare pr pr providers that are called non-participating, mean, meaning they do not accept what Medicare offers. What, 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 what Medicare says is the limit. The, med, the, the uh, limiting charge may be 920, right? Medicare still will only pay that 640. Your health plan, depending on your health plan, is only required to pay what they would have paid, that 20%. And you might have that liability of that extra 120, depending on your FEHB plan. For those of you who have the Foreign Service Benefit Plan, not to worry, we cover it, you're still okay. The next type of provider is what we call these private contract providers. And these are these Medicare opt-out providers. Now remember, I'm, I'm talking to uh, about if you are over age 65 and you have both Medicare Part A and B and a fee-for-service FEHB plan, okay? Now, these opt-out providers have decided they want nothing to do with Medicare. They will ask you to sign a written agreement between you and them. And what that means is that you, um, that you are liable for all of the charge. You, can, they, you cannot bill Medicare or any of the other Medicare plans, Medigap, whatever. No claim can be submitted to, to Medicare, but they can't make you sign this in an emergency. All right. But if you're just going to the phys physician because you like that doctor, this is what they're going to have you do. Now, I know you want me to say that it's great to be a fad and your FEHB plan will, will handle it. Yes and no. Yes, it is good to be a fad. Yes, your FEHB plan will pay, but because you have Medicare, your FEHB plan will only pay the amount we would have paid had you gone to a Medicare doctor, meaning that 20%. I have another chart. Now we have gone through what happens if you go to a provider that accepts, that accepts Medicare assignment. We've gone through what happens if you go to a doctor who does not accept Medicare assignment. In the case of these private opt-out do doctors, okay, Medicare won't pay any of the cost. We will know what the Medicare approved amount is. We could only pay what we would have paid, that 20%, meaning that your liability in this scenario may be $840. So not saying it's good or bad for you to go to a private contract doctor wouldn't say say that it's strictly your choice but understand that if you have medicare part b and the fehb plan and you go to an opt-out physician your liability may be a little more than you expected so this is just a heads up for you so in summary under this part the the this section if you're retired and over age 65 you have one of the, the regular FEHB plans and Medicare. Medicare Part A and B is primary for you, but your plans will fill most of the gaps that medic, in, in, in Medicare that is covered by them. But be aware of those skilled nursing facility li limits. The plan will coordinate with, with Medicare. So depending on what doctor you go to, generally you have little or no li liability. And bonus, the FEHB plans will remain primary for your normal prescription drugs. The stuff that you get through mail order at your drugstore, what, whatever, um, except for the limited number of injections at your doctor's office, some of those oral cancer drugs, things like, like that. But the normal medications that we take will be covered, will continue to be covered under your FEHB plan. So you're pretty well taken care of. It's great to be a fed. Now, if I have anybody in the participants that have one of those FEHB HMO plans, Kaiser Permanente, United Healthcare, Care First, whatever, how does that work with Medicare Part B? 
Well, let's kind of explore that br briefly. FEHB HMO enrollees may not necessarily need Medicare Part B because you can't recover any of the cost for those Medicare Part B ex expenses. However, there's always a but, right? But Medicare Part B might pay for costs that you may have if you see a provider outside of that HMO network, or if you, for example, decide to winter in Arizona and you have a doctor there that isn't part of that your HMO back here, Medicare Part B would cover that. So th there's always an if and a how, how, however, but you really want to think long and hard about if you want to, if you keep your, your federal employees health benefits HMO, whether you actually want to spend the extra for Medicare Part B. Just a thought, not good or bad. It is a personal decision, but I want to bring it up. Okay, so let's talk about some incentives that your that your FEHB plans will put, have put in to incentivize you to take Medicare Part B. Most of us have copay and coinsurance and deductible wa waivers, so that if you have both the M Medicare Part B and the FEHB plan, we'll pick up all of that. Some of the plans have lowered prescription copays for members who have. Medicare Part B as an incentive. And some of the plans have put in very limited reimbursement for a portion of your Medicare Part B premiums. Those are in section um, 5H of your FEHB bro brochure. If the plans offer that, it will be in that section. It's not gonna cover all of Medicare Part B premiums, won't even cover half of Medicare Part B premiums but it is an incentive that some of the plans are offering for you to take or stay with Medicare Part B. Now let's talk about the federal employees, um, the, the um, Medicare Advantage plans that are brand new. You know, there are just a, a few of them out there. Um, it's geared strictly to federal an annuitants. Um, you must enroll in Medicare Part A, a and B, prescription Part D that may be optional, depending on what federal employees MAP plans you have, you, de you, you are interested in, it may include that prescription drug benefit or it, it may, may not. If it doesn't, you're gonna have to go to a Medicare Part D plan. There may be additional benefits out there, wellness vision um, that, that they may in, in include. You won't have to suspend your FEHB plan as you would if you took a commercial Medicare Advantage plan, all right, because it is all in, included under your FEHB plan. But be aware, there are some optional value added pro pro programs, again, depending on what federal employees MAP plan you choose, you could get extra meal delivery, transportation to medical appointments, um, telehealth, fitness benefits, including silver sneakers, yes, silver sne sneakers, um, hearing aids, vision, th th things like that, some of which are already covered under your, your regular traditional FEHB plans as well. This all sounds very, very good, but I also wanna caution you, understand that the Medicare rules apply. This is not the same coverage as you might be used to with your regular FEHB plan benefits. So if you are looking at one of these federal employees Medicare Advantage plans that are really up and coming, then really pay attention to what it does and does not cover and who has control over your, the plan, whether it is your plan sponsor or whether it is Medicare and CMS. That could really make a, a difference in how the plan operates not good or bad. I think it's the wave of the future, but you just need to understand that. So here's some Medicare ins and outs. Medicare does not provide coverage for spouses or children. There is no family coverage under the Medicare program. So that premium I was talking about, that monthly premium for Medicare Part B is not per family. It is per person. So really look at that when you're looking at Medicare Part B. Now, 
FEHB, whatever FEHB plan you have, will remain primary for a spouse if that spouse is under age 65 who cannot get Medicare Part B, or if the spouse decides not to have Medicare Part B. Not to worry, spouse would still be covered under your normal FEHB plan. There are a lot of ins and outs. So I always refer you to section nine, don't care what FEHB plan you have, the brochures are all the same. You can look at section nine, and look at how your individual plan handles Medicare and coordination of benefits with, with Medicare. Now I may have some tandem couples out there. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of information. Again, Medicare Part B is an individual decision. You both don't have to take Medicare Part B. You both can if you or if you qualify at age sixty-five or sixty-seven or whenever, right? But it is an individual decision. FEHB remains primary on the spouse on the, the the spouse if the spouse decides not to take me Medicare. But here's something to think about: if one spouse is active duty, say you're a tandem and one spouse retires and one spouse is active duty, you may want to consider that to move your, your FEHB enrollment to the spouse who is still on active duty. Why is that? Because remember I talked about that special enrollment period? Well, if you are covered under your spouse's active duty plan and your spouse is still working, then you would enjoy that same special enrollment period when your active spouse retires. So you, at if you were over age 65, if you're turning age 65, do not have to make that Medicare Part B decision because you would qualify for that special enrollment period when your active duty spouse retires. May not be for everybody, guys. It, you might have to, it, the premium might be higher compared to a two self-only plans, but you can delay that Part B premium. So again, it's not good or bad. It's an individual decision. I just wanted to bring it up because it may work in your benefit if you are a tandem couple. So the next is I may have some people out there who are TRICARE. And they are looking at TRICARE for Life and how it works with the FEHB. Now, first and foremost, I have to stay in my, my lane and I have to tell you, I am not a TRICARE expert, but I have pulled some information from tri TRICARE that might help you. And I also have some resources out there. Medicare Part A and B are in the, in your in enrollment in Medicare Part A and B is required if you want to maintain your TRICARE eligibility or your TRICARE for life. So unlike the FEHB, that doesn't require that Medicare Part A, A and B enrollment, TRICARE absolutely does. If you use TRICARE for life and continue your FEHB, TRICARE is normally the last payer after Medicare and your FEHB. And then if there's anything le left over, then it, it, it turns to, to tri TRICARE. Now, this is another time that you can actually suspend, not cancel, but suspend your, FA, your FEHB enrollment if you are enrolled in TRICARE for Life. And then you can return to FEHB at an open season. So you do have some flexibility there. But before you decide to suspend your FEHB, I want you to consider just a few of the, the following. Do you spend a lot of your, your time or do you expect to spend a lot of your retirement time when you're overseas? Remember what Medicare does and doesn't pro provide. Or do you have a specific benefit that is covered by your FEHB plan that may not be covered by either Medicare or TRICARE like massage or something like, like that? So really think about that. Tons of information out there for you. I've listed some of the resources and the publications that I think might help you when you are looking at um, how TRICARE and the FEHB and Medicare all work to, together, all right? Um, hopefully that, that will, will help you out with that. And of course, always you can always contact your TRICARE counselor as well. 
So now I've spent most of my time covering what happens when you have both Medicare and the FEHB plan. Now let's turn to what happens if you decide not to enroll in Medicare Part B and just stick with your FEHB plan. Well, remember when I said it's great to be a Fed? And remember when I said that it's great that you can take your FEHB coverage with you as a retiree? So I can honestly say nothing happens. You get the same benefits as you did before. It's one of the very few plans that you can, programs that you can actually take your health insurance with you. As a retiree, you get the same benefits at the same premium. So again, it's great to be a Fed. And by law, this, this 890905 law, in certain circumstances, your liability may be limited as if you had Medicare Part B. Here's what that FEHB law says. So under the law, the fee-for-service plans must limit our payments to inpatient hospital care and physician care to what we would have paid if you had had Medicare. And by law, those Medicare participating and non-participating non providers and also the hospitals cannot bill you for any more than they would have billed you if you had had Medicare and they were billing Medicare because you are under another federal program, the FEHB. Now you're going to be responsible for your deductibles and coinsurance and co-payments under your FEHB plan, but you are now, right? So again, nothing changes. Now, those opt-out and private contract physicians aren't, aren't obliged by the, the, this law. Neither is certain outpatient care and non-physician-based care. They are not covered under this law. However, remember when I said no, nothing changes? Neither does your individual FEHB plans network. So if you are using an in-network provider, under your FEHB plan, whether it's us and you're using an Aetna in-network net provider, or you have the Blue Cross Blue Shield pro providers, those same discounts will apply. So you still have protection because you're a federal annuitant and you have the FEHB plans. So should I or shouldn't I? Let's talk about should you enroll in Medicare part in, in, in Medicare. Again, the decision is yours. Medicare Part A, it's free to this audience. It assures 100% coverage when you're coordinating with your FEHB plan. So why not? Might as well do it when you turn age 65, regardless of whether you're working or not. Part B, now that's, that's the kicker. Let's come back to that. Part C, if you wanna keep what your, your regular FEHB benefits, you still must have Medicare Part A and B. So from, let's think about that. Probably there's no big ed advantage to you to go to a commercial Medicare Part C plan. Part D, that's the drug coverage. All of your FEHB plans have credible coverage. So probably you probably don't have to enroll and pay that extra Medicare Part D premium that is also subject to means testing. So. I know it's a tough de decision and you're probably going back and forth and many of you are on the fence about Medicare Part B. So let's kind of break it down a little more. First, will you be spending a great deal of time outside of the United States? If the answer is yes to that, you know that Medicare doesn't cover anything outside the U United States and those Medicare Part B premiums can get pretty hefty. Okay, just something to think about. Second, what is your financial situation? Well, remember, you, your eyes probably popped when you saw that chart about the Medicare Part B premium and the adjusted gross income. But consider the cost of health care. Also, if you have Medicare Part A and B and one of the FEHB plans, you are, depending on what physician you go to, you are virtually 100% covered. So no matter what your how your health your your your, your financial situation is, you are one hundred percent covered virtually, and your income may change as you retire. 
because remember this happens every year. They look at your, your 1040 statement from two years back and that determines your current year Medicare Part B premium. So your Medicare Part B premium may very well go down depending on your modified adjusted gross income. Third, how is your health? Now I know that we're all healthy now and we're all ready to get out there once we retire and we're gonna climb the mountains and we're gonna hike and we're gonna bike and we're gonna do all those great things because we feel great, right? Well, unfortunately, as we age, we are going to likely seek additional medical care. What is now, you go to the physician, you go get your checkup, you go to the doctor once every six months, may turn into once every month, different specialists, whatever. Every time you walk into a doctor's office, you're going to have a copay or a coinsurance. So you are going to use more medical care. So you need to think about that. And this is really important too. Do your favorite doctors accept Medicare? If you've been going to your favorite physician for the last 20 years or so, and you trust them and you have a great relationship with them, what are you going to do if you ask you take Medicare and they say, no, we're opt out? Well, that decision might be very easy for you to make then. And fourth, this is kind of a throwaway. What is your tolerance to paperwork? I know you love filling out our claim forms and you look forward to that every year and every month that you, you, you have to fill them out. Not so much, right? So if you have Medicare and the FHB plans, there's a lovely little thing called Medicare electronic crossover. Here's how that works. You go to your physician, they are a Medicare doctor, whether it's participating, not non-participating, right? They file with Medicare, Medicare does their magic, they pay the claim and Medicare files with your health plan. So you virtually have no paperwork, which is really awesome, right? It's really great. Some people think it's worth the Medicare Part B premium. Just kidding. I have covered a lot in the hour, actually 55 minutes that we've been together. And I know you're going to have a lot of questions afterwards. So I've put some resources here for you. OPM has resources. Social Security Administration has resources. Medicare has resources. And your own health plan has resources. For those of you who have the Foreign Service Benefit Plan, this is our pamphlet that has how we handle Medicare and the Foreign Service Benefit Plan. You can get it off of our website. We'll be happy to send you one, whatever you wanna do. If you have a plan other than the Foreign Service Benefit Plan, I recommend that you contact your, your whatever FEHB plan you have and see if they have a similar brochure. That will talk that will talk about how they handle the coordination between Medicare Part A and B and themselves, and what how they they handle if you do not take Medicare Part B. So with that, I want to offer my um and any questions, Kyle. I'm sure there are no questions out there for me. I've been bored for the last um, hour. No, we had some fantastic questions and I'm gonna do my best to organize them as we go through. Um, so uh, Paula, thank you first of all very much because that is a lot of information. Um, and I, I, a lot of the questions people come back and said, oh, Paula just covered it, I get it now. Um, but there are still some people out there who, who have questions and we're gonna try to address those now. So Paula, when it comes to the, the premium for delaying your enrollment in Part B, mm -hmm. um, the question came in, um, the 10% Part B premium is compounded or not? So for instance, is that 50% based on what it would have been when you were first eligible? Or is it, a, it they're, they're using five-year delay with the 50%? Right. Or is it 50% of the current premium rate? So does it change each year or is it just the, an additional amount based on that, that first year when you should have enrolled? Well, that's a Medicare question. So I would recommend that you go to the, the, that Medicare site and talk to them about it. I believe it's to the, it, it is based on current. All right. But that, that I would have to stay in, in my lane and refer them to the Medicare because that is the, is a 100% Medicare decision. Good. 
Um, Paul, we have a, a number of people joining us from overseas and, and we appreciate it. Um, so someone asked generally, and, I, and you touched on this, but, but how would it work if I retire overseas and do not take Medicare Part B? Would my usual FEHB benefits apply? And in particular, this person mentioned foreign service benefit plan. Okay, so if you retire overseas and stay overseas, and you, of course, decide not to take Medicare Part B, that's fine. You have, again, whether it's a Foreign Service Benefit Plan or any of the other fee-for-service plans, I have to be fair here, you would have the same benefits you have now. So you would have the same, if you have the Foreign Service Benefit Plan, we would, be, we would pay the same, 100% for hospitalization, 90% for, for medical, what, whatever. If you come back to the sta States and you go, you have to go to the hospital, you have to see a, a doctor here, you don't have Medicare, not a problem. We pay the same as we would have paid no matter what. If you go to an in-network pr provider, it's not 90%. If you go to an out-of-network pr provider, we still pay, it's at 70%. Pr percent. So you still have that flexibility wherever in the world you are. Okay. Um, sticking with the overseas theme, the, the question, and, and this may be one where we need to refer folks elsewhere, but I wanted to ask it, um, is Medicare accepted at um, overseas military treatment facilities? Well, that is a good question. Um, and I don't know the answer to, to, to that. But I think that um, if, if you have the email of the person who asked the answer, I think we could find out and we can make sure that it gets it gets to, to them, but I'm not going to guess at that one. Okay, so the I, and I'll, I'll reach back out to the person who asked that question okay. so you can get your prize yeah, for stumping Paula <laughs> um, and me. Uh, <laughs> I, did, I even did some searching. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we'll, we'll get you some more information. Let's talk about part B. Okay. So we, we started there and, and talked about the penalty. Um, there was a question, if I enroll in part B, you know, at age 65, and I decide down the line that I don't need it, can I drop it? Yes. The answer to that is yes, you can drop it at any time. All right. You just talk, you know, call up Social Security, Med 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 Medicare, whatever, and drop it. Understand, though, that if you want to re-enroll at a later date, you may be subjected to that Part B penalty. Remember? So you, you need to make sure that you know the the consequences of dropping it but absolutely you can you can drop it and then you can enroll during a general enrollment period which is january through march of every year okay what about is there an option to suspend medicare part b under any circumstances you're aware of I'm not aware of any suspension. That is a Medicare Part B question, and I would refer to me Medicare and to Social Security on, on that, but you can drop Medicare. Okay. Um, so uh, this is an interesting question. I think we're kind of probably push somebody back to their retirement or HR office, but so somebody is a recent retiree. If that person is reinstated to federal employment, could they withdraw from Part B until they leave active employment the second time? Well, they can withdraw from Part B, it, uh, ab, 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 absolutely. And would, would they face a penalty when re-enrolling later if, if they are then leaving active employment a second time? So, okay, so it just depends. So yeah, so the, this is a, a, an it depends question because, it's, because here's why. Depending on how they are rehired, all right. If if you are rehired and wherever and whatever position you have conveys FEHB eligibility and you are rehired and it is active duty, then of course you can drop me Medicare because you would qualify for the special enrollment period, right? But if your FEH, but if that position doesn't convey FEHB and you are still getting your FEHB as a retired person, then I would think long and hard about dropping it because then you would have that penalty because you're, you're having your health insurance as a retiree, not as an active employee. Okay. So I would recommend that 
first of all, you need to find out from HR about what that position actually conveys, whether it includes active FEHB coverage or not. Most of them do not actually, okay? And if you are continuing to receive your health plan as a retiree, then if you drop that, that um, me me Medicare, you're gonna face that pen penalty if you re-enroll. Okay. Um, and Paul, I, I know this will probably come as a shock to you, but we got a lot of questions about Medicare Advantage. Um, okay. So you touched on this and, and some of the, the new Medicare Advantage plans that are coming out within the federal program. Right. Um, so here we go. Why doesn't ASPA offer a Medicare Advantage plan? Well, we and... don't offer it right now. Okay. All right. Um, but in uh, on all honesty, we are very seriously looking at it. We wanted to make sure that number one, it's, it's a right fit for our, our members. And we needed to understand the rules because our members are used to a certain way that AFSPA and the Foreign Service Benefit Plan does things versus how CMS and Medicare do, does things. But I will tell you that the, the reason we haven't offered it is that it's very, very new. We wanna make it, we wanna get in when it's right instead of fast. And our members should look forward to more information about a potential Medicare Advantage plan that's offered by through the Foreign Service Benefit Plan in the future. Without giving too much away. Got it. All right. Um, then there somewhat some of the questions touched on both the Medicare Advantage as well as this next question. Um, if I sign up for Medicare Parts A and B, why am I continue to pay the same premium as I would if I didn't have Medicare Part A and B? All right. Well, there's two things. We're all when, uh, so you're talking about because the FEHB plan, whatever, no matter what plan it is, would be secondary to Medicare. All right. So here's the thing. When Congress decided to offer the FEHB program that became effective in 1960, they set certain parameters. We're all one happy family here. The good news is because we are a one happy family, you can continue it into retirement. The bad news is because we are one happy family, we cannot change the premium. The premium has three. First, it was just two. Then a few years ago, it was three. Self only, self and family. And then just a few years ago, it became self plus one. There is no division between active and retiree. So it would literally take an act of Congress to allow your health plans to change the FEHB premiums for retirees. Okay. Okay. And, and Paul, we've got a, a number of questions that have come in about TRICARE, FEHB, and Medicare. And I think you, during your presentation, shared as much as we feel comfortable sharing. Um, I, is that fair? That is fair. Okay. And I do want to reiterate something that you shared during the presentation, which is that with TRICARE for Life, um, uh, people who are enrolling that program must enroll in Part B, correct? Parts A and B, absolutely. Yeah, Parts A and B, yeah. Yes. So we had a, a number of questions about that. I do want to put a plug in. Paul and I are working with someone who has experience as an enrollee in all three programs, um, as well as some it, um, experience administering some of these programs. And we're working on a podcast that we hope to have up in um, February that will that will dive deeper into this and with someone who can go deeper into this than we can. Um, they, their lanes are, are more than ours are and, and wider. So um, I, I encourage you to look for our podcast on your favorite podcast app. Um, it's called AFSPA Talks. And um, we should have that episode up sometime. Um, we're planning to do a focus on Medicare throughout the month of February. Um, so just just a, a plug a plug there. So I'm I'm getting a lot of questions coming in. I'm trying to sort through them as we're going through things. Um, and Paul, the, there was a question here just for level setting. What is CMS? You've mentioned that several times. Can you okay. just um, uh, provide CMS that that background? Is the, is the acronym for Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Okay, 
perfect. And they, they regulate Medicare, Medicaid, and, Medicaid. and set standards for others. Um, there was a question here, uh, and this is specific about the Foreign Service Benefit Plan. Is it true that Foreign Service Benefit Plan will waive coinsurance, copay, and deductible if the member is enrolled in Medicare's Medicare Parts A and B? If so, is there any scenario where a member would have anything to pay out of pocket? Okay, so it is true that the, that the Foreign Service Benefit Plan as part of the, in, the Medicare Part B in, incentive that I talked about does waive the hospital de de deductible if there is one and the medical deductible and the coinsurance on the and the, the, the co-pays for the inpatient daily co-pays, co if you get into that, all right? So we waive all of that. We also will pay for the Medicare deductibles on part Medicare Part A hospital deductible and Medicare Part B medical de deductible. We would cover that. What we do not waive is the prescription drug co-pays. So, the question is, is there a scenario that, that they would have any charge? The answer is yes. You would still have your normal med or prescription drug co copays. Okay. You would also, um, we would pay for, we do cover the participating and non-participating co-insurance. So even if you went to a provider who was a non-participating provider, the Foreign Service Benefit Plan covers that limiting charge, that extra 15%. If you had both Medicare Part B and the Foreign Service Benefit Plan, and you went to a, and you go to a physician who is an opt-out physician, we could only pay that 20%. So you would definitely have liability going to an opt-out physician. Okay. okay. Yep, I think so. And there was a, a question for confirmation here. So to confirm for FSBP to waive co-pays and deductibles outside of the drug cost, you must enroll in part A and B. That is correct. Um, and we did have some questions and you covered this. Uh, what if I carry over my FEHB plan and do not purchase Medicare Part B? And, and you went through several slides of that at the end. And I'll reiter reiterate again that we will be sharing these uh, this presentation with you in the next two weeks. But Paula, is it fair to say that benefits continue um, into, you know, when somebody retires, even if they're Medicare eligible and decide not to enroll in Part B? Absolutely. Under the FEHB program, you are allowed to continue, if you qualify as a retiree to continue your, your FEHB plan into retirement, that's an HR thing you've got to do all the 10 years service or whatever it is that would allow you to take your FEHB plan in with you to retirement, you decide not to take Medicare Part B, then your FEHB plans would cover you just like they do now. There is no change. Fantastic. It's one of the it's one of the the great benefits of being a federal employee. So, Paul, we had an interesting question, um, which I think comes up more often um, than people realize, and that is when uh, spouses are covered on the same plan. One is primary, one uh, one is the enrollee, and one is covered as a dependent, but they're different ages. So in this scenario, the person says, you know, I'm the, I'm the enrollee and the federal employee. I'm still working, uh, but my spouse is covered as a dependent and is not working. Um, should my spouse enroll in part A when she turns 65 before I retire? The answer to that is absolutely. And, you know, regardless of whether you're working or not working, when you turn age 65 and you qualify for premium free Medicare Part A, there is no reason not to enroll in, Medi in, in, in Medicare Part A. What about Part B? Part B, again, um, if the insurance, as you say, is you are an active employee and you have coverage as an active employee, and your spouse, who is the older one apparently, is covered under your health plan, then that spouse does not have to make that Medicare Part B decision 
because they would qualify for that special enrollment period, that eight month period after the active duty spouse retires. Because they, they, they check all the boxes of that special enrollment period as a spouse. Okay. And um, Paula, just, you, you mentioned that, and I think I, you've sort of answered it, but just to be explicit, um, can, uh, once a federal employee retires, so this is somewhat separate from Medicare, but once an, a federal employee retires, can they keep their family members, their eligible family members on their insurance? For the, I assume you're talking about the FEHB. For the FEHB, yes. Yes, yes absolutely. Um, they, they, they can, as, as long as they can choose from self plus one, if there's only one family mem member or self and, and family, if they have more than than one other family member. And you don't have to take self plus one. You can keep a self and family um, option for you. And you can continue that under the FEHB program. Okay, good. Uh, what about, so there was also a question that someone has coverage for their vision and dental needs through the FedVIP program. Mm -hmm. um, do they continue being eligible for coverage under the FedVIP program once they retire from federal service? Or at that point, do they have to look at a, a Part C plan or some other option for their dental and vision needs? Under the, uh, under the Federal Employees Dental and Vision Insurance Program, retirees can continue, or can, can continue coverage under that program. And they can drop it. I mean, under the FedVIP program, actually, as a re retiree, you can you enjoy the same open season benefits and flexibility as an active employee. So even as a retiree, you can change your federal dental vision or, or, or vision insurance. You can get into the program. You can drop the program, whatever you want to do under the, the, under the federal employees dental insurance program. Realize I muted myself. Um, I, I would get more questions coming in, and they're all good questions. Um, give me just one second. Um, Paul, some plans offer a uh, rebate, essentially, or payment to members who enroll in Part B. Right. Um, can you discuss a little bit how that works? Is that something that FSBP is considering? So um, it, it, it is something that FSBP is con considering under the Foreign Service Benefit Plan potential Medicare Ad Advantage program. That is future, all right? The Foreign Service Benefit Plan now does not offer that incentive. Now, some plans do. Uh, for example, if you go to the, I think Blue Cross Blue Shield does, they're only their basic program, not their, their standard program. I believe GEHA does. There are several of the other FEHB plans that will offer a, an incentive. And here's how it, it works. It is under section H of the plans bro brochure, and it is a reimbursement. So what you have to do is they will reimburse you for up to a certain amount a month or a year, whether it's $600 a year, $800 a year, whatever it is for your Medicare Part B premium. And you've got to, there are instructions, they all worked it differently. So there are instructions in that section H, 5H of, your bro, of the brochure that tells you how to get that reimbursement. It's not necessarily a, a, a rebate, it is a reimbursement. Excellent. Um, Paula, uh, we had a couple questions about opt-out providers. Mm -hmm. um, you, you touched on this and, and provided you know, appropriate warnings and caution to um, folks participating. So there, there were a couple questions. One was essentially, you know, are there a lot of opt-out providers out there? Well, if you listen to the news, they're all opt-out providers, right? Not necessarily the, the, the case. We look at this occasionally you know, to, to make sure. And what I can tell you is that there may be a lot of opt-out providers in this area, but 
the chances that you cannot find a Medicare participating physician are really slim to, to none. Many of the, the doctors, especially in certain zip, zip codes, may be opt out, but most doctors will take, will um, do cooperate and accept me Medicare. Okay. And I also will tell you that there are more physicians going into the Medicare program in any given year that are opting out of the Medicare program in any given year. Um, and Paul, there's just a question which I think will, will vary, but um, are most opt out providers also out of network with, with plans? Oh, now that's a, a good, good question. And surprisingly, not necessarily. All right, so while these physicians may decide they do not want to participate in any way with Medicare, whether it be the reimbursement rate or the, the paperwork or whatever their reason is, most of the physicians will participate with the major health plans, whether it be like we, our ad administrator is Aetna. So, I mean, there are a million physicians that participate with, that are in that network with, with Aetna. Um, Blue Cross has a million do do doctors or more too. So just because they are not participating in any way with Medicare doesn't mean that they're not a network provider for that individual health plan. And I covered that when I, I talked about, remember I said, everything stays the, the same. So you can still get that, those discounts through your plan if you, are, if you decide not to take Medicare Part B. Okay. Um, and Paul, we've had also a, a couple questions about, you, we, we touched on this just a moment ago when we talked about who, uh, keeping family members on um, coverage. Mm -hmm. um, are there requirements for, you know, it, for children? Uh, that some of the specific questions about children, coverage is up to age 26 to their 26th birthday. Is that right? Yes. Are there any requirements prior to age 26 that they be living with a, with the okay. enrollee, financially dependent, uh, full time student, anything like that? So under the Affordable Care Act, that was all that you know the the Affordable Care Act changed all that way back a decade ago now. Um, so under the FEHB program, your dependents you you can add your dependents to your federal employees health benefits plan. Up until they are age 26, they do not have to live with you. They do not have to be a student in a college. They do not have to be financially dependent on you. They don't even have to talk to you for them to be on your health plan, as long as you have either a self and family plan or a self plus one plan, and they're the only ones that they, that they are your plus one. Once they turn age 26, they would come off of your health plan but they would also then be eligible for the federal version of, 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 of COBRA, which is temporary continuation of coverage. So you would wanna look at that. And is there any, we, we had a couple of questions. Are there any situations under which, um, besides TCC, under which um, children can continue to be covered after age 26. If they're a full-time student at that point, maybe they're in graduate school or something, does that give them an, an opportunity to remain in, enrolled um, out, outside of the TCC option? It does not. Okay. Age Good. 26 is the cutoff. Good. Um, so I apologize. I'm trying to sort through all the questions. So it, it said there's a good question here that may provide some clarity around the, the new federal Medicare Advantage programs. And uh, it says if under a scenario where AFSPA offers a Medicare Advantage plan, uh, can someone switch to that or another Medicare Advantage plan from Medicare Part A and B without a penalty? And would they need to suspend their FEHB at that time to enroll in the, let's say, AFSPA Medicare Advantage plan. All right. Well, in, so of course there is no AFSPA Advantage Medicare Ad, Advantage plan yet. We are still working on that. So I can only speak in generic terms. And generically, under the most of the the federal employees retiree Medicare Advantage plans. All right. You still have to have Medicare Part A and B. 
So there isn't any suspending of, you're still going to have to pay that Medicare Part B premium. Plus the premium of the, the federal employees health benefits plan, whatever it is. Now, most of these plans, and we are also lo looking at this in full disclosure, most of the plans will offer a reimbursement to help pay for Medicare Part B. It will not be 100% coverage. It may be you know, 75 or 100 bucks a month, but it is an incentive to keep Part B, but you still are going to have to have Medicare Part A, Medicare Part B, pay for that, that um, pre premium, and then also the premium of your FEHB plan. The advantage though, with having a federal Medicare Advantage plan is that you, you still are under the federal program. So what you're, even though it may be the rules and regulations are going to change because the Medicare Advantage plan will be under the auspices of the CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they're the ones who will be in charge of that plan. You still have, you're still part of the federal family, if you will. I hope that explained it. It's just really hard to speak in hypotheticals when we, you know, when we don't have a foreign service benefit plan advantage plan yet. So I can only speak in generic terms. Okay. And Paul, I want to go back because we've had two or three questions about this. Um, and it is a, a, I'm going to ask it in a very general way. Um, and it, it deals with eligibility upon retirement. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. Eligibility for children Oh, age 26 and older to remain covered if they have a disability, mental or otherwise. Okay, so that's entirely different. Okay, so what you're talking about here, Kyle, I think is what there is a, a thing called a certificate of incapacity, All right? And under the Federal Employees Health ben Benefits Program, there are certain di diagnoses, certain con conditions that if your child had those before they turned an adult, all right, age 26, then you would have to go to your agency and, and, and this is an HR question. And the agency usually has primary responsibility to determine if whatever condition your child has will continue beyond age 26. And they will determine whether you can keep your child on your health plan after age 26. And then the agency will notify your health plan. Once someone is retired, regardless of whether they enroll in Part B or don't enroll in, enroll in Part B, do they still have the option to change their FEHB plan in retirement? All right. So the answer is is yes. Again, uh, the, the FEHB program is very flexible. Open season comes around every single year and retirees do have the, uh, the, the, the option to change at that time. They can make an open season change or a certain qualifying life e event in the middle of the year. Well, if, they, if they have an FEHB plan and it's an HMO plan and they move out of that, that geographic service area, then they can change. That's a qualifying life event, right? If they have a, if they're retired and have self and self and family coverage and their child turns age 26 in the middle of the year, they can certainly drop their coverage down, right? So, um, so there are lots of different things that, that they can do as a qualifying life event, but open season is the primary. I think we've addressed most of the questions either specifically or generally. For now, um, I want to say thank you, Paula, um, for, for leading us through this discussion and fielding all of these questions. And thank all of you who hung in there with us for the whole presentation and for your fantastic engagement. It really makes these, um, these opportunities, these webinars worthwhile when we have such an engaged audience and such excellent questions. So we hope to see you at a future event. Paula, any closing remarks before we wrap up? Sure, thank you very much. I just wanna thank everybody. Again, I know that the material is, is, can be very confusing, it's very dry. Um, and uh, you may have, uh, hopefully I've answered some of your questions. 
probably led to more questions. So please feel free to re reach out to us. We at AFSPA value your, your membership and are looking forward to serving you in any way we can. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Ask for Talks, a production of the American Foreign Service Protective Association. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show and tell your friends about it. We welcome your feedback on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Look for at Ask the Cares. All information offered in this podcast is meant to be educational. Comments offered by the hosts or guests are not intended as medical advice. Please direct questions about your personal health needs to a provider. Should there be any discrepancy between information offered in this podcast and official plan documents for the Foreign Service Benefit Plan or other products offered by ASPA, the policy provisions will prevail. We'll see you next time.